all, I'd like to convey my sincere thanks to Professor Ashok De and uh, uh, Professor Avijit Kushari for inviting me uh, in this great conference. And I'd like to also thank you for showing solidarity to st and stick around till the last talk of the day. Uh, the title of my talk, as you can see, is uh, uh, Dealing the Energy Water Nexus Using a Skin Deep Approach. So what I meant by skin deep was initially it's about I'm doing something on the surface, but after coming to this conference and seeing the enormous scholastic presentation, I really find that my approach is still very skin deep. Nevertheless, uh, if I just stop speaking in fear of that, chairman will bar me from tonight's dinner, so uh, I'll continue. As we all know that uh, energy and water are the top two global challenges that we are facing today. And this challenge is not actually very recent because the nature has been uh, not benign everywhere. Uh, if we, for example, focus uh, this part of the world, Namibia, the Namib Desert, it's one of the most arid places on this planet. And uh, with a paltry rainfall of two to 200 uh, millimeters, but this place is also endowed with a unique feature which is called morning fog. Every day from the ocean, the air current brings in uh, dew. And this species, Onimacris ungucularis, uh, locally no named as a, a Namib desert beetle, they use this uh, morning fog to quench their thirst. What they do is, they, in, the ev in every morning, they climb to the top of the dunes, take this pranama position and uh, uh, harvest fog at their back. The back, which is also known as elytra, has some uh, strange features. It has got some uh, bumps, roughness, and it's also coated with some wax. Uh, it's, it's mildly hydrophilic, uh, but it allows them to collect as high as 12% of their body, uh, body weight in terms of water. And they are not alone. There are other uh, species in, uh, in the desert, like this bushman grass, which has uh, uh, prickle hair, microcrystalline silica, and uh, wax coating on their uh, leaf surface, which allows the water, the fog droplets, to stick to the, get intercepted, and trickle down the leaf, collect at the base, and the, the plants, they take the water from that. And our engineering approach should strive towards mimicking nature to uh, attain this goal, at least to do something so that we can ameliorate the energy and water problems. Now, I'll, I'll just quickly pass over this, uh, a brief overview of surface phenomenon, although uh, it, it must be pretty mundane to most of you. Uh, we all know that surface tension arises from the one-sided molecular interaction, that the molecules on this side of the liquid pulls the surface uh, molecules. And it's not only a feature of liquids. You can get a, a surface tension of any solid like this floor. Uh, and when you have a liquid uh, resting on a solid surface because of the interaction of the surface energies of the liquid, solid, and the gas it's immersed in, uh, a, a contact angle emerges, which, is, uh, which kind of characterizes the surface. And depending upon this contact angle, we classify the substrates or the liquid substrate combination as superphilic. Uh, in case it's water, it's called superhydrophilic, hydrophilic, hydrophobic or super hydrophobic, depending upon the contact angles. And the examples in nature are also abundant, starting from lotus leaf to uh, leaf where you spray some surfactant to spread the insecticides. And it's not just the contact angle, but also a dynamic contact angle, like what is known as an advancing and receding contact angle, which are vital. Because if you have a drop of water on a plate and you tilt the plate, you will find two distinct contact angles in the leading and the trailing edge. And the difference of these two contact angles are known as contact angle hysteresis. And that's also important, as we shall see soon. Uh, we can treat the surface or we can tune the surface wettability by several methods. First of all, if we want to coat the surfaces so that its surface energy per unit area gets changed, you change the wettability. And that we can do by coating different materials. For example, you can make a metal surface hydrophobic by coating Teflon or fluorinated hydrocarbons. Uh, and the coating process can involve several techniques. 
The second factor of treating the wettability is the surface roughness. Uh, depending upon the roughness heights, the spacing, uh, the liquid can actually impel into the crevices of this rough surface or it can flow on a cushion of uh, the gas, which is also known as the Fakir effect, like the sadhus sitting on pin cushion. Uh, the liquid can show different behaviors, starting from what you see on a rose petal, you see a nice superhydrophobic kind of behavior, but you invert the petal, it doesn't fall off. Vis-a-vis, -vis, you have a lotus leaf where the water simply rolls down. All these are important features as we shall see later. And the surface roughness actually can be tuned. If you tune or rather play with the surface roughness feature, you can see the uh, transition from a Wenzel to a Cassie-Baxter behavior as we we have seen through uh, simulations. These are done, or basically these are uh, uh, done in uh, surface evolver softwares. Uh, the, sur the way we treat our surfaces, mostly metal, are, uh, involve chemical etching. First, we do uh, mechanical rubbing, by, like sandblasting, to impart miniature roughness feature. Then we treat it through chemicals, like chemical etching, as through acid or alkali to get the micro and nano roughness. And if we want to hydrophobize the surface, we often uh, coat it with a fluoroalkyl silen. Uh, something similar to what you have in your non-stick cookware, but with a much thinner surface. And what do we do with those uh, tuned surfaces? Well, uh, we have several attributes, and uh, uh, I don't know if I'll get time to cover all of them, but uh, our one task is to collect fog from cooling towers uh, in power plants, for example. Uh, the other task that we are uh, trying to get achieve is like uh, we have humid environment in most of the part of the India, and if we can harvest water from the uh, uh, water from the air, means the vapor in the air, uh, it, it particularly can lead to a good savings. Uh, most importantly, in the coastal area where the water is saline. A similar uh, solution can emerge when we use solar steel and uh, it involves condensation of water vapor on surfaces. And also we are trying to develop a self-cleaning surface which we can use as a coating for solar photovoltaics uh, cells. So uh, uh, about the cooling tower fog harvester, the first task that I mentioned in my bullet list, uh, as we all know and are familiar with, the cooling towers which are used for uh, rejecting heat from the heat engines that we use in a power plant is a colossal source of water loss. The water comes out from these cooling towers primarily in the form of vapor, unevaporated water vapor which we know as drift, and some of the vapor that recondenses as it comes in contact with the cold ambient air. Now, of course, we cannot really condense the vapor it's essential for the heat rejection from the uh, thermal cycle, but if there is a way we can cut down the later two components is uh, essential. Uh, apart from the importance uh, of reducing the water footprint, uh, cooling tower fog abatement can also help in like reducing the damage to the electrical equipment in a power plant. Also, it uh, reduces other issues of fog like health hazards and visibility problems. So what we did, uh, one of my students who works in a, a utility thermal power plant uh, just put up a metal mesh in the what we know as cell of a cooling tower, which is the chimney of the cooling tower, and we saw some fairly good collection from those uh, uh, small metal mesh. They, they were like this big. And uh, so we were happy, but at the mo same time when we did the calculation, we were sad because the collection efficiency was uh, very, very low. And when we dug the literature and uh, also tried to rationalize, we found that these are the major causes of uh, poor collection efficiency. First of all, a large amount of uh, fog-laden air simply bypasses, uh, aerodynamically bypasses the mesh. Now, if we make the mesh denser in order to avoid uh, this bypassing, the entire air stream will bypass because it will find it as if it's a solid obst obstacle. So there is no easy solution to Im I improve this aerodynamic efficiency. Then whatever um, uh, small amount of fog droplets deposit on this surface, 
they can get re-entrained by the drag of the air stream. You can have premature dripping because of the gravity. The water comes, uh, collects, uh, drips down even before they are collected on the, on the designated collector. Sometimes the water can clog the pores of the mesh so that now the mesh becomes like a solid obstacle and the next fog stream bypasses the mesh, uh, thereby reducing the efficiency. And also, of course, there is al always pestering problems of uh, durability. So what we found out that the desired mesh properties should be like, it should have a geometry which will give us better aerodynamic efficiency. The water shouldn't fall down very easily, so the mesh should have a good adhesion. It should easily slide down to the collector, means the sliding angle should be low, and it should be durable. Now the second and third points are actually conflicting with each other because more, for most of the mm, surfaces, if you have a high contact, uh, if you want a good adhesion, it, the side effect is a high contact angle hysteresis. So what we are stuck at this moment is what is known as mesh conundrum. But there are uh, surfaces which you can, I mean, you can tune the surface so as to have a high normal adhesion as well as a low contact angle hysteresis and we are working towards that. So these are the forces, I mean when we analyze these are the salient forces that uh, a water droplet when it sits on the fiber of a mesh, uh, it experiences. Uh, when we uh, did an analysis of all these forces, there are possibilities like if it's on this side, the water can drip, drip down, it can get re-entrained because of the drag, the contact angle hysteresis may hold it here so it's pinned and it eventually grows to clog the entire mesh pore. And after doing all these analysis, we, uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, we, we came up with a, 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 a plot or a, or a uh, operating regime map where we found that there are regimes where the, depending upon the droplet size, the mesh can be clogged, the, there could be like dripping from the mesh, there could be re-entrainment, but the green reg regions are what are the desired one where we can get the desired collection. So what we did was we treated the mesh, uh, we made it super hydrophilic, we made it super hydrophobic using different chemical treatments which involved like etching, thereby making the surface rough and also grafting uh, hydrophobizing elements, uh, ma materials on that. And therefore we were able to get different kind of liquid solid behavior as the droplets deposit on the mesh. And when we use them, uh, we got like, I mean, the result is, of course, I mean, it's, it's not so fantastic we initially <laughs> thought of, but of course, depending upon the inclination of the mesh, we found that somewhere the, uh, like we, we use different types of mesh, the TiO2 coated, the titanium dioxide coated, that's, that's one of the method we, I mean, way we treated the surface, gave a higher uh, collection efficiency when the mesh inclination angle was uh, less, whereas uh, in another case, we had a hydrophilic metal mesh which gave better collection. It's, it's still ongoing and we are trying to tune the mesh wettability and doing several other physical, I mean, giving physical attributes to the mesh to improve this collection efficiency. The second uh, part which actually, I mean, originated uh, back in 2013 when I spent a year in, sab uh, in sabbatical at UIC were like uh, mm, capturing water vapor from the atmosphere. As we all know that uh, this atmospheric water vapor capture would uh, essentially include condensation of the water vapor by using a subcooled surface or a cold surface. And we know that the condensation primarily occur in two different, two, two major modes. One is a drop-wise and the other one is a film-wise condensation. Uh, this is a drop-wise and this is a film-wise condensation. When we have a, a, a can of a soft drink, uh, we find that the, the condensation starts with tiny little drops, beads appearing on the cold surface. The beads, they grow in size, coalesce, and eventually they all uh, merge together forming a film on top. 
And this is what happens in most of the industrial applications. And there are problems associated with it because the condensation involved nucleation of the water vapor on a surface. And when it nucleates on a surface that's coated with water, it's homogeneous nucleation, which has a much lower rate than heterogeneous nucleation. That is what when the nucleation takes place on a piece of metal. So uh, film-wise condensation is bad. Drop-wise condensation is better. Uh, also, the liquid film that is formed on, in case of the uh, film-wise condensation, offers a thermal resistance, thereby decreasing the heat transfer coefficient. So what can we do to improve the heat transfer coefficient? We need to go to drop-wise condensation regime. But then there's a catch also, like in drop-wise condensation, if the droplet size grows bigger, is bigger, it adds again to the thermal resistance of the droplet. And there are, there are several different models for explaining the um, heat transfer, uh, heat, heat, heat transfer resistance models for uh, the dropwise condensation. So we need a surface that has a low hysteresis so that the droplet before growing big is shed by gravity. And how can you do that? We can make the surface low hysteretic, like we can make it super hydrophobic but then there's a catch. A surface that is super hydrophobic, which will also have a low hysteresis angle, it's water heating. Means that the nucleation barrier for uh, 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 is, is very high, meaning that it doesn't really nucleate so fast like other surfaces. If we have a hydrophilic surface, it will have a large contact angle hysteresis. So the water droplet will not budge and eventually will grow and coalesce and will create a film. Again, a problem. How to remove the droplets and yet have a high nucleation density. So what we thought of going is, uh, we termed it a biphilic approach. Biphilic means hydrophilic as well as hydrophobic. So what we do, uh, did was we had a surface where we selectively made part of the surface hydrophilic or superhydrophilic and left the remainder as hydrophobic or superhydrophobic or even uh, hydrophilic. And when we have a drop of water falling on such a binary wettability surface, this is superhydrophobic and superhydrophilic, we found that the liquid exhibits capillary driven transport. Quite intuitive. And how can we do this kind of uh, biphilic surf, make this biphilic surface? Well, we can cover part of the surface and then etch selectively uh, exposed surfaces. And that's a, a traditional technique that is uh, followed even in uh, microelectronics industry where we do selective etching. And uh, that's how the etched surfaces would look in terms of the micro nanostructure behavior and the surface roughness. And these are the uh, how the liquid droplets would behave on, 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 on such surfaces. One is hydrophilic, uh, this is super hydrophilic, this is a fluoroalkyl silent coated, this is super hydrophilic, this is super hydrophobic, and if we treat the surface, same surface with laser, it again becomes super hydrophilic. So what do we do with that? What we found is that when we had a surface that is biphilic, you can probably see these stripes of super hydrophilic tracks on a super hydrophobic background. When we uh, put it under condensation, we found that the droplet size is bigger here than the droplet size which are growing on these interdigitated space. So we were able to actually uh, modulate or rather reduce the droplet size by uh, changing the design of these biphilic stripes. But again, there's a problem. What we found is that these stripes were giving good result when the humidity was low, but at high humidity conditions, these tracks, which were the super hydrophilic tracks, which were pumping or draining the water, they get clogged, and it's like a, uh, our drains on a highly, uh, under torrential rain, it gets flooded. So we need a better mechanism to transport the liquid on a surface. Generally, on a rough superhydrophilic surface, the transport takes place by two means. One is called hemi-weaking, which is a washburn spreading, follows a washburn spreading kind of behavior. The other is capillary pumping, which we all know that because of this curvature, the liquid is pushed by its, uh, the, the Laplace pressure. 
Now, washburn uh, kind of spreading is like inherently uh, inefficient because under this washburn spreading, the velocity of spreading scales inversely with the distance it propagates. And that's what makes the baby's life more difficult as they have difficulty with the wet diapers. So washburn spreading isn't good. What can we do? Now our idea was if we can use the Laplace pressure driven flow to move the fluid without the aid of a pump so that the liquid is disposed of from the condensing surface. So what we tried and I mean uh, came up with was like uh, if we have a surface, this surface, it's, it's a metallic plate and coated such that these parts are hydrophobic, super hydrophobic and these are hydrophilic. So you can see nice pearl like water droplets sitting on the super hydrophobic part. And when we put a gentle tap on this, uh, the droplets disappeared. Of course, it's too fast to notice, but when we saw it under high-speed camera, the plate was pushed on this side, so because of inertia, the droplets were jumping onto these tracks, which are super hydrophilic, and you can see that they are being pumped from this narrower end to the wider end with such a vigor that none of the droplets could escape. So what pumps this liquid from this narrow end to the wider end? Now, uh, there's, there's a paper in Science back in 1999 which says that if you have a super hydrophilic track on a hydrophobic background and you keep pumping liquid here, the liquid will somewhere bulge out. Our simulation also showed similar behavior of bulging if we keep pumping liquid on a uh, narrow track that is super hydrophilic on a super hydrophobic background. So we have this, when we have these bulges, what happens is that and, and this track is instead of a rectangular track, we have a trapezoidal track. There is an uneven contact force on these droplets so that they get a net forward push. You can also think it in this term that the curvature on the rear end of this droplet is more than the curvature on the front end so that the net Laplace pressure is pushing it. Yeah, I'll uh, finish it. And this way we were able to get something, uh, a velocity, exceeding the washburn limit. I'll skip these details. What we found is that the, depending upon the viscosity and the surface tension of the liquid, we can have different velocities of the propagating uh, liquid on these diverging tracks, but uh, when we uh, put them on a normalized curve where, uh, like this, we find that they all collapse, what we actually got from a scaling analysis was that there are three principal regimes of this transport of liquid on the track comprising of uh, washburn behavior which primarily arises from a balance of capillary to viscous force where the capillary length scale is the port diameter of the crevices or the roughness of the super hydrophilic track. In the second regime, it's a capillary versus viscous uh, competition but not this one. There the length scale is something different that is the equivalent to the diameter or radius or the size of this bulge that is developed. And in the third regime which is known as a dissipative regime where the slope actually kind of uh, matches uh, something similar to what you see in a Tanner Hoffman spreading. So what we did was we tried to, we had those diverging tracks and we tried to use it for enhancing the condensation. So what we did was we created a sharp tooth kind of pattern where we had this diverging super hydrophilic track, the background was hydrophilic. So water vapor was condensing and nucleating on this hydrophilic regime and this is super hydrophilic means these were used as a drain. And uh, the liquid transport as we expected, uh, give us behavior, like if we had any droplet which is touching this super hydrophilic track, it should drain down. And so when we use this on a condensing plate, what we found is that it's a condensing plate and the droplets, they grow, they, they nucleate and grow and since this uh, surface here, it's not super hydrophobic, it's hydrophilic, the nucleation barrier is less and the, there was a problem that this entire surface would eventually be covered with film. That problem is eliminated by putting these tracks which keeps continuously drain the liquid, pump the liquid in the direction of the diverging track and drain it regularly through these highways. <coughs> the effect, 
we got 35% improvement in heat transfer coefficient from as compared to a regular hydrophilic <coughs> surface. That's a huge improvement if you, uh, if you think it in terms of heat transfer enhancement. And we found it that we can play around with the size of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, what is it called, the real estate. Uh, Trump is visiting, so real estate is a big thing. So uh, the real estate that you invest for the hydrophilic to the super hydrophilic tracks. Uh, lastly, I'll just skip this uh, solar collectors. Uh, we are also developing a, 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 a chemical route for coating, uh, super hydrophobic coating on glass slides, which we plan to uh, put on uh, solar photovoltaic cells so that they, we can make it self-cleaning. Of course, the challenge there is it has to be as transparent as possible, and yet it has to be, I mean, the, uh, the dust should fall from it uh, with very small amount uh, or use of water. So uh, this, this is the surface that we got. It's, it's basically uh, on, a, on an SIH4 uh, background, we put some silicon nanoparticles and coated using deep coating mechanism on the glass. And this is an AFM image of this surface, but I'll, uh, uh, the, the extent of transmissivity loss in that surface, we noticed it was around 8%. But the uh, SPV generation was uh, pretty comparable. So this is how the liquid is repelled on a surface. This is on a clean glass slide, which is treated with our surface. Then we collected some dust from the Metro Railway site and put it, sprinkled it on the slides. And this is how you get the glass cleaning, two minutes. Uh, and uh, if, even, even it, it worked pretty, pretty well with the high level of dust loading. So uh, this work is, uh, again, ongoing, and we are working towards improving the transmissivity of these liquids. And what we saw there, this is interesting, and I wanted to focus it, that uh, when we had a, 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 an untreated glass, it definitely had a higher transmissivity than a coated glass. When we deposited some amount of dust with a known or <coughs> measured quantity of water, we cleaned it, the transmissivity was regained. But what happened was that with treated glass, the transmissivity was uh, resurrected to this level, whereas untreated glasses, this is how much at max you can get as the retrieval of the uh, transmissivity, which means there are still dust sticking onto the untreated glass surface. So that's the benefit we get derived out of the coating, we would say. I would like to thank my colleague, Professor Amitabha Datta, the students who have worked on the fog and also on the condensation area, and my collaborator at the University of Illinois Chicago, Professor Constantine Magaridis and his team, and Professor Devojyoti Ghoshal in the Department of Chemistry at Jadavpur University. Once again, thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kankuri. So we might have two quick questions from the floor. OK. Please introduce your name and your institution as well. I think you were talking about this slide, right? So we have uh, two surfaces. One is treated, the other is not treated. When we have some amount of dust, you can see that the dust loading increases. What happens? The voltage that you get from the, um, uh, from the, super, uh, the solar photovoltaic cell underlying the, coat, the glass, it decreases, meaning that the output of the SPV cell would decrease. Then we put a measured quantity of water, 20 drops, for example. What happens? The untreated glass will be cleaned so that its voltage increases to this level. But if we are using a treated glass, this is the extent to which the voltage is regained. Compare it with the initial level. With a coated glass, we get almost up to the initial level. Uh, we, get, uh, we can clean the glass um, almost completely. Right. So one of the problems with super hydrophobic coating is that it, the dust part will not be in that much coverage. So after that, it will be with super hydrophobic coating. 
No, the super hydrophobic coating as I showed in the videos is that the beauty of super hydrophobic coating is that look the droplet is falling and as it spreads it doesn't stick there and when it falls down it carries all the dust along with it and you can see that there are dust particles already in the liquid droplets. So the principle of super uh, self cleaning is something uh, there is a schematic I am not sure if I can yeah. So this is what happens in an ordinary surface the dust stays there and the liquid which is kind of sticky on the surface it's the dust is left behind but what happens on the super hydrophobic surface is that the dust has a better affinity towards water than the surface so when the water droplets rolls down it picks up the dust on its way so that was only one question right yeah We, we have not, we have uh, some plans which uh, uh, at this moment I'm not uh, divulging, but there are, I mean, uh, people are working on different types of design like Jonathan Boreco in Virginia Tech, they are working with a harp design. So it's like a big harp where you have wares going vertically down. So you don't have the cross wares and they have shown that they get a better collection if they just use a harp. But the problem is that, the wind kind of blows the harp and the, there is an issue of supporting these uh, big strings, array of strings uh, on a frame uh, uh, in, in the face of wind. Thank you very much for um, the good questions and also your interesting talk. Thank you.